Tiny little Czech Republic. The 115th largest country in the world, or 82nd smallest country in the world, if you want to look at it that way, just underneath the UAE and just a little bit bigger than Panama. 78,866 square kilometers, 30,450 square miles, smaller than Tasmania in Australia, a little bit bigger than New Brunswick in Canada, just a teeny bit bigger than South Carolina in the United States, and a teeny weeny bit bigger than Scotland in the UK. And yet we're 62nd in the world in terms of population density just above Denmark. We have more castles and chateaus than almost any other country in terms of sheer numbers, around 2,000, and the densest collection of such structures in the world per square kilometer. We have one of the oldest universities in the world and the largest castle complex anywhere on the planet. And the Czech Republic is 21st in the world when it comes to the number of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. We have 14 such sites plus another 17 on the tentative list. It's pretty easy to visit most of these places since we also have one of the densest rail networks in Europe and pretty decent bus coverage as well. So there's a lot of there there in the Czech lands. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. So what is the UNESCO World Heritage List? A World Heritage Site means that UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, has recognized that this place or area is of significant value to humanity and should be preserved as much as possible. There are 1,121 World Heritage Sites in 167 countries around the globe at the time of recording. We have 14 of them in the Czech Republic. UNESCO doesn't go looking for sites to add to the list. Countries submit places to them with their justifications as to why they think they should be included. A panel of experts in various fields then examines the candidate place, looks into its history, and so on and so forth. Places that seem like they might be worthwhile first get put on the tentative list and further investigated. People from the International Council on Monuments and Sites, as well as the World Conservation Union, look into the application and the site and they make recommendations to UNESCO. Once a year, the World Heritage Committee meets to make their final determination for new additions to the list. If a place meets certain criteria and has been recommended for being moved off the tentative list, then it gets added to the World Heritage List. Now, places on the World Heritage List do not receive money from UNESCO, though many people think they do. Countries can apply for assistance from the World Heritage Fund for a place that's been listed, but that's a whole separate process and the money is not guaranteed. And if you're not on the list, you can't apply. So, why would anybody care? Prestige, bragging rights, plus places on the list see a lot more tourism, which means more money coming in. Unfortunately, it also means more people, and so more wear and tear on the place that you're trying to preserve. A place on the list is also automatically protected in case of war under articles contained in the Geneva Convention. That won't automatically protect a place from getting bombed, but it would make doing so a war crime. So that's something. As I said, we have 14 places in the Czech Republic on the World Heritage List, and in this episode, we're going to look at the first six that were added. Obviously, Prague City Center is on the list. It was added in 1992 with some boundary modifications made to the zone in 2012, expanding it. The UNESCO listing says, quote, The historic center of Prague admirably illustrates the process of continuous urban growth from the Middle Ages to the present day. Its important role in the political, economic, social, and cultural evolution of Central Europe from the 14th century onwards and the richness of its architectural and artistic traditions meant that it served as a major model for urban development of much of Central and Eastern Europe. 
The listing goes on to mention the, quote, urban architectural ensemble of outstanding quality, the city's role in developing Christianity in Central Europe, and Prague's political and cultural influence over its 1,100-year-long history. The UNESCO zone as it stands today is a roughly Africa-shaped area. The northern edge goes along the northern edge of Letna Park on the Prague 7 Peninsula, goes west to include Hradchani, the castle quarter around the castle, then drops south to include Malastrana, cuts over to the western riverbank around Cafe Savoy, right where Malastrana and Prague 5 Smichov meet, continues south to around Smichovska Naplavka, crosses the river down by the Iron Train Bridge, swoops over on the other side of the river to include Vishorad, winds north through part of Nove Miesto, grabs Stare Miesto and Yosefov, and then continues north, once again crossing the river just past Stavnitsa Island to include the eastern edge of Letna Park. Before 2012, the zone only extended from Letna down to the National Museum on the southern edge of Wenceslas Square, so a lot of that was added. The UNESCO listing isn't in jeopardy exactly, but UNESCO is keeping a close eye on it. Developers are constantly building things that they're not supposed to in and near the zone. Notably, the high-rise structures out at Pankratz, which spoil the old skyline with looking south from the hill in Letna Park. UNESCO keeps warning us that they will remove Letna from the UNESCO zone if we keep building tall buildings that ruin the skyline. That view is part of why Letna is included, but we just keep doing it anyway. When first warned some years ago, the Prague City Council seemed to think it was a bluff since UNESCO had never stripped any place of its World Heritage status, and then they stripped Dresden of its listing because of some very modern bridges they built. After that, the Prague City Council just kind of admitted that they just don't really care. Capitalism is king in post-communist Czech Republic. Now, what many people may not know is that Pruchonica Park is included in the same listing. This park technically sits just outside the city's southern limits in the village of Pruchonica, which has become something of a highfalutin area for wealthy Praguers to own homes in. The park was founded in 1885 by Count Arnošt Emanuel Silva Toroka, a man who was heavily into landscape gardening. The famous Bocic Stream, which starts at a spring south of Prague in a forest near Chenyatica, flows through the park as it heads north to Prague. The park has a neo-Renaissance manor house and a small chapel, as well as a botanical garden that was used to introduce new and exotic trees and flowers to Bohemia and from here to the rest of Europe. It's currently maintained by the Botanical Institute of the Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic. There's no train there, but you can take bus 363 or 385 from the Opatov metro station that's on the C or Red Line. The bus rides about 15 minutes. The park opens at 7 or 8 in the morning, depending on the month of the year, and stays open until 5 o'clock in the winters, 7 o'clock in April and October, and 8 o'clock in the summer. Entry is 100 crowns for adults, 60 crowns for kids and seniors. Children under 6 are free. Dogs must pay a 20 crown entry fee and be kept on their leashes. The same year, 1992, the historic center of Chesky Krumlov was added to the list. This is a town in southern Bohemia. The castle there, founded in the 13th century, is the second largest in the country after Prague Castle and has Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque elements. The town itself is almost unbearably cute, a classic example of a Central European medieval urban center. This is one of those places that gets suggested when visitors to Prague say, well, if there's just one place besides Prague to go see, what is it? The answer is Chesky Krumlov, if you don't mind hordes of tourists. The castle is very much worth strolling around in, as are the grounds. There's a very well-preserved Baroque theater in the castle, where a couple of times a year an opera is performed using only candles for illumination, and the town itself is worth checking out. You can take a train from Prague to Chesky Krumlov with a change in Chesky Budjevica, the whole trip taking about two hours one way and costing 300 crowns one way. Trace Station is a little bit of a hike from the center, however, so you might consider taking a train to Česka Budivica and then switching to a bus because the bus station is much closer to the center of Česky Krumlov. Or just take a bus all the way from Prague. The direct bus usually leaves from the Nakanizetsi station in Prague 5 over by the Andiel metro station and takes just under three hours one way and costs 200 crowns. Other companies go there as well. Flix Bus is also around 200 crowns, takes a little over three hours. Regio Jet, about the same time in price as the National Line. It doesn't matter which of the two Chesky Krumlov bus stations you go to because they're both pretty close to the center. Just remember which one because they're on opposite sides of the center. 
1992 was a busy year, and the third place to be added in that year was the historic center of Telch in the Visocino region near the Bohemian-Moravian border. It's mainly a square. A very nice square, to be sure, but a square. Originally founded as a royal fort in the 14th century, though locals claim a lineage as far back as 1099, the wooden buildings were all replaced with high Gothic stone structures in the late 15th century, some of which underwent further work in the Renaissance and Baroque styles later. The Long Market Square has an arcade that goes almost totally around it, which is a pretty unique feature for a Czech town. It is incredibly well-preserved, having avoided the 19th century let's-make-everything-art-nouveau craze that swept through this region, and there are a couple of bodies of water and some nice woods as well. In fact, the forests in the area were planted in the Middle Ages as part of a revitalization scheme, and there's an English-style park next to the 17th century Renaissance Chateau. As I said, it's nice, but it's really all about that square, which honestly you can see in about seven minutes. But a lot of people really like it. There are a couple of direct buses each day. The trip takes three hours and costs 175 crowns. Or you can take a bus to Yihlava and then transfer. It takes about three hours one way and about the same price. There are, of course, a number of other combinations you can try out as well. It'll basically take you between three and four hours and it will cost you less than 200 crowns to get there. The fourth property added to the UNESCO list was added in 1994. This is the incredible Pilgrimage Church of St. John of Nepomuk at Zelena Hora, also in Visocina. Built shortly after Nepomuk was canonized, this church by Santini, the rather famous architect, sits right on the line between the Gothic and Baroque styles, and so it's very unique. It's got a central structure surrounded by gently curving star-shaped fortifications all the way around it. And frankly, it's most spectacular when you can see a photo from the air. Santini was a bit of a numerology guy, and the whole place is infused with encodings of the number five, a number normally associated with John of Nepomuk. The architect's aim was, quote, the creation of an independent spatial reality. John of Nepomuk was the royal confessor to the court of King Wenceslas IV, who was the son of Emperor Charles IV. Václav was something of a ne'er-do-well and constantly suspected his wife of cheating on him, probably because he was constantly cheating on her and, you know, cheaters suspect others of cheating. He knew Nepomuk would have heard her confessions and he tried to force him to tell him the queen's secrets. Nepomuk refused, so the king hired ruffians who accosted him on the Charles Bridge to make him talk, and when he didn't, they beat him and tossed him into the river where he drowned, the queen's secrets remaining unrevealed. His body washed up a few days later, supposedly with a still living tongue. This was the first in a series of miracles that would eventually lead to his canonization as the saint of Bohemia and protector against false accusations as well as against floods and drowning. So he's a bit of a favorite with sailors. Kind of funny for a landlocked Prague and the Czech Republic. He's also one of the more important saints in the Catholic Church, with pilgrimage trails all over the place and many, many churches devoted to him. In Spanish, he is known as Nepomucino. The church sits atop Zelena Hora, or Green Mountain, which really is just a hill on the edge of the town Zdarnad Sazabom. The train and bus stations are right next to each other at the southern edge of town, and the church is on the northern edge. It's about a four-kilometer walk, a little over two miles. Trains from Prague take about two and a half hours to get there and cost 230 crowns. Trains to Brno and some to Zdarna and Sazavo also passed through the town of Kutna Hora, which was added to the list in 1995. The name means something like the excavated or dug out mountain, and this is a reference to the famous former silver mines there. These mines produced a lot of high quality silver in the Middle Ages, and an Italian was brought in to write up mining codes that would become fairly standard throughout all of Europe for centuries. They also minted the Groschen a coin that became the de facto currency throughout much of Europe during this time. The town of Kutnohora, called Kutenberg in German, was once much larger than it is today. It rivaled Prague for its importance and flourishes. After King Wenceslas IV, 
who had Nepomuk killed, was imprisoned for basically being a big jerk. Sigismund of Hungary came to Bohemia to try and take it over, and he sacked Kutnohora in 1402. Right after the Hussite Wars broke out, Sigismund used the town as a base to attack the Taborites, who were a rather radical Hussite group. The 1420 Battle of Kutnohora ended with the one-eyed Hussite general Jan Zizka victorious. Jan Zizka is one of only eight military leaders in recorded history to have never lost a battle. So even though the Hussites won, Sigismund's troops burned down the city in 1422. They rebuilt, but in 1546, the biggest mind flooded. The town then participated in an insurrection in 1547 against Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I and lost its official town privileges. Then the Black Plague ravaged the area, and by the time the Swedes came round on that extended shopping trip known as the Thirty Years' War in the early to mid-17th century, the town was basically broke and had to buy off the invaders with barrels of beer. And then in 1770, a fire wiped out most of the city, and that was kind of it for Kutnohora. Today, it's got about 20,000 people, which from my perspective makes it a town, but Czechs refer to it as a city. Kutnohora has a very well-preserved medieval center with an old Gothic well and one of the best plague columns. These are columns that were built by the survivors of the Black Death as a thank you to God for not killing everyone. It also has the second largest cathedral in the country, the Cathedral of St. Barbara, which floats like some kind of huge ship over the tiny valley below what's left of the town walls. This structure by Johann Parler, who's the son of the famous Peter Parler. Peter Parler is basically responsible for what we might call the Prague architectural style. And the cathedral is considered one of the finest Gothic structures in all of Europe and greatly influenced architects across the continent. Originally, it was supposed to be twice as large as it is, but the budget wasn't really there because the mines were running low, so they cut the project scope in half. Work started in 1388, the three-point roof was finished in 1588, and final touches were put on in the late 19th century, including some fantastic Art Nouveau stained glass windows. When you go inside, you'll notice these windows are only along one side of the building. That's because a bomb fell in the yard during World War II and blew out the windows on one side. These were then replaced with just normal clear glass. On the way to St. Barbara's, you can see a teeny tiny vineyard on the side of the hill. You can also take a tour of the old silver mines. Warning, there are a few tight squeezes down there, so claustrophobes, you've been warned. But that's not all. A couple of kilometers northeast of town, there's Sedlets. Used to be a separate kind of place, but now it's been sort of incorporated into Kutnohora. Here is another cathedral. This one started off as Romanesque and eventually ended up with Gothic and then later some Baroque elements added as well. So it's another architectural mishmash, and yet it works. It was founded in 1142 as part of the first Cistercian Abbey in Bohemia, and you can go inside and even walk up near the roof among the wooden rafters. Very close by is the Sedlet's Ossuary, sometimes called the Bone Church, one of the main attractions in the area. It's really a chapel next to the All Saints Cemetery, and it is filled with somewhere between 40,000 and 70,000 human skeletons. And these bones have been rearranged into various works of art. It's rather famous, having been featured in an episode of Ripley's Believe It or Not, the films Blood and Chocolate and Dungeons and Dragons, episodes of Long Way Round and Adventures in Architecture, and various legs of the U.S., Australian, and Israeli versions of The Amazing Race. Rob Zombie says it was his inspiration for the design of Dr. Satan's digs in his movie House of a Thousand Corpses. Here's the story. In 1278, the abbot of the monastery, a fellow named Henry, went to the Holy Land and got some soil from from what he was told was Golgotha Hill, where Jesus was crucified. He brought this soil back and scattered around the cemetery, so now this had a direct connection to Jesus. So anybody who was anybody wanted to be laid to rest there, and it was a pretty popular place to get buried. Oh, but then the Black Plague swept through the area in the 14th century, and lots more bodies got added sort of willy-nilly to the mix, often dumped in mass graves. Then casualties from the Hussite Wars further added to the chaotic total. There were a lot of bodies down there under that special sanctified soil. Oil. In 1511, a half-blind monk was tasked with digging the bones up and stacking them as a first step in maybe trying to catalog all of it. Finally, in 1870, a local woodcarver named František Rint was hired by the Schwarzenberg family, who owned the land, to do something with all these bones. 
he proceeded to construct a series of bell-shaped towers made of human skulls, a chandelier with one of every bone in the human body, crosses made of bones, a coat of arms for the Schwarzenberg family made of bones, and he even signed his name on a wall near the entrance in bones. It's a weird and creepy and pretty cool place. The Bone Church has become so popular that just before the pandemic hit, the authorities declared that tourists would no longer be allowed to take pictures in there. Sure, it's cool and creepy, but it's also still a place of burial, and people should show at least a bare modicum of respect for the departed. You also may not enter if you are scantily clad, or drunk, or obviously on drugs. Despite these prohibitions, in normal years, it gets over 200,000 visitors every year. Entry to the Cathedral of the Assumption of Our Lady and St. John the Baptist, the Sedlitz Cathedral, is 60 crowns, to tiny St. James Church next to the cemetery is 50 crowns, and to the ossuary or bone church is 90 crowns. So if you want to see all three, that's 190 crowns. You can also book special 77-minute long evening tours of the bone church for groups, but they ain't cheap. 1 to 10 people is 12,500 crowns, and then for every 10 more people, you add another 1,000 crowns up to a maximum of 60 people, which costs 17,500 crowns. Reservations must be made at least two weeks in advance. The area around Kutnahora is also worth checking out if you have the time and inclination. The city of Cologne, which is checked for Cologne, as in Cologne, the German city, Köln, is about 10 kilometers northwest of Kutnahora. Now, I used to live in Kutnahora back in 1993, and back then, Colleen was a super polluted toilet of a town, but it has since cleaned up quite nicely. The city was founded in 1261. It's, it's got a good number of Gothic and Renaissance buildings, a 13th century church by Peter Parler, and a pretty good-sized Jewish cemetery in Old Jewish Ghetto. It also has a bit of macabre history as well. It was one of the manufacturing centers for the notorious Zyklon B gas under the Nazi occupation. It was also the hometown of 19th century performer Jan Kaspar de Borchak, who moved to Paris and changed his name to Jean Gaspard de Borau. There in Paris, he created the clown-like pantomime character of Pierrot, who would become the basis for all mimes in the future. And speaking of clowns, current Czech president Miloš Zeman was also born in Kolín in 1944. Just outside of Kolín, there's a Toyota manufacturing center as well as the village of Kolnarovica, where American actor Crispin Glover has purchased a 17-bedroom, 17th-century chateau on 20 acres of land. He collects film sets, which he stores on property. Composer Bedrich Smetana's patron, Count Jan Harach, used to live there, and Smetana, widely considered to be the father of Czech opera, occasionally worked on some of his projects in the chateau. Glover lives there part-time, but the chateau is not open to the public. 11 kilometers southeast of Kutnohore is the village of Chaslov. Founded way back in the year 800 as a citadel, it has one of the oldest regional museums in Bohemia, a Moorish-style synagogue built around 1900, and in the church just off the main square there, a part of the skull of the undefeated Hussite general Jan Zizka was found not that long ago. Not far away is a very active air base of the Czech Air Force. So, while you're walking around there, you will see jets flying overhead at high speed. But Chaslov's biggest claim to fame is that it's the birthplace of Czech-born film director Miloš Forman, who left communist Czechoslovakia for the United States around 1970 to make the film Taking Off, and then just kind of stayed. He would go on to win Oscars for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Amadeus, be nominated for Best Director for The People vs. Larry Flint, and he would win many, many other awards. And the final thing to talk about in the area is Visoka. This is a hill six kilometers west of Kutnohora. Go past the 12-sided Gothic well and then just keep going towards the hamlet of Miskovica. The name Visoka means high, which is a bit funny because it's only 472 meters above sea level and most of that is not the hill. Local legend had it that buried beneath this hill, there is a large stone and that stone is the heart of Europe in much the same way that Tara and the stone that was buried there was considered to be the heart of Ireland. It's not the geographical center of Europe, mind you. That's a topic under much, much discussion with various claims being made for places in Slovakia, Hungary, Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, Belarus, and Sweden, as well as HEP in the Czech Republic. Though the geographical center of the EU, now that the UK has left, seems to be somewhere in Bavaria. No, this is more like the spiritual or sort of mystical heart 
above the continent. Maybe it's where the ley lines meet or something. What we do know is around 1697, František Antonim Spork, who owned the surrounding Malashov estate, had a Baroque chateau built on top of this hill. This might be the first high Baroque structure built in Bohemia. He also built a small chapel dedicated to St. John the Baptist next to it. He called his chateau the Belvedere, and rumor had it that he'd won the money for its construction by playing cards. He threw a spectacular party on June 24, 1697 to commemorate the consecration of the chapel with 20,000 partygoers, 60 barrels of beer, a fountain from which flowed wine instead of water, two whole stuffed deer, an ox stuffed with geese and ducks, and 5,000 loaves of bread, just to name a few items on the menu. He also had 1,000 commemorative medallions made of silver and tin to mark the occasion. The next year, a hermitage was built next door, and Spor continued to throw some extremely lavish celebrations for various occasions, like his son's birthday. The property passed down to his heirs, but then on April 30th, 1834, the place caught fire. Some say it was struck by lightning. Others say that it was April 30th, which is witches' burning night, and some drunken revelers let their fires get away from them and accidentally burned it down. Oops. The place was completely demolished, and today it is a rather magnificent ruin. Also up on top of the hill, there is a very tall lookout tower, the top of which is reached by climbing a winding staircase. The whole area around this hill has all sorts of interesting things. They found remnants of Neolithic settlements. They found some medieval lime kilns. A 300-year-old Baroque statue of St. Aldebert sits in the village of Hojani in a park which is the only place in the country the website is happy to tell you where the aquatic plant Gronlandia densa grows. There are also several limestone quarries and more than a few chapels. All of this is just sitting an hour or so outside of Prague. To get to Kutenhora, you can take a train or a bus. The, the train usually goes through Colleen, sometimes you'll need to transfer, and takes a bit less than an hour and tickets are about 120 crowns. The train station's off to the northeast, kind of outside of town. You can take a local bus into town, or you can walk the three kilometers or so to get to the city center. And walking's nice. First, you go past this huge tobacco factory owned by Philip Morris, the second largest in Europe, and then you go into Sudleds, where the Bone Church and the other cathedral is and all that stuff. Hint, right by the Cathedral of the Assumption of Our Lady and blah, 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 there's a great little pub called Hosenets Uzlataho Leva or at the Golden Lion, which is a great spot for a beer and some classic Czech eats. By the way, the local beers brewed in Kutnohora, the Kutnohora City Brewery Beer and Dachitsky, are both worth trying somewhere. Buses will get you closer into town, but they take longer, about 90 to 100 minutes. Personally, I'd rather take the train and walk, weather permitting. Since you're probably going to go see the Bone Church as part of your trip anyway, it is literally on the way. Plus, the walk into town is flat. We've been bopping around Bohemia, but now we mosey over to Moravia and an extraordinary place. The Lednica Voltica cultural landscape was added to the UNESCO list in 1996 and is one of the largest artificial landscapes in all of Europe. It's in the heart of the Moravian wine region, next to the Palava Protected Landscape Area, which is a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. We'll talk about the Palava in another episode, but for now we want to focus on the wildly eccentric Liechtenstein family and the numerous follies they built in the lednica Valtica region. The two towns of Lednica and Valtica are about 8 kilometers apart, and the surrounding 300 kilometers has numerous treats and surprises. Between the 17th and 20th centuries, the Dukes of Liechtenstein built classical and neo-Gothic castles, landscaped the hell out of the area, putting in ponds and forests, winding walking paths, exotic plants and flowers, and basically treated the area like a super rich person's playground. They were greatly impressed with the work of 18th century English landscape architect Lancelot Capability Brown, who's sort of credited with being the father of what we now think of as English gardens, and so they basically had a bunch of work done on their property that was similar. Now, the whole area is not really one big park, but really it's more like a series of connected smaller parks. And because of the time scale of the work, the structures in the area are a blend of romantic and Baroque elements. What's most notable, however, are the 15 follies scattered throughout the area. 
These are large structures simply plopped down somewhere, often with no discernible purpose other than that they gave the Liechtensteins pleasure. Here are a few of them. There's the Colonnade, or Reisna in Czech, a 19th century neoclassical colonnade sitting up on a hill about a mile southwest of Voltica. It's huge and has no purpose besides just being there. There is an observation deck on top, however, if you want some pretty awesome views. There's the Belvedere, a early 19th century building erected for Alois I of Liechtenstein to basically hang out in. The center structure is an octagon with a dome and then wings go off to either side. Sometimes state visitors would be put up there, but mainly it was just used to lounge around in and occasionally throw a party. After a fire in 1894, restoration work turned the central hall into a Chinese cabinet with porcelain figures and rare silk wallpaper from China that originally had been at the French Palace of Versailles. Several items that once belonged to beheaded Queen Marie Antoinette were also on display. There's the Temple of Diana, a neoclassical empire-style hunting lodge from the 1810s, also sometimes called just Rendezvous. It's shaped like a huge triumphal arch. When you first look at it, you do not think hunting lodge. There's a temple to Apollo, a neoclassical hunting lodge that looks like, well, like a Greek temple, complete with the sun god himself in a chariot, cupids playing the lyre, and statues of the four muses. Snug inside the pine wood, there's a Gothic Revival column structure chapel devoted to St. Hubert, patron saint of hunters. These folks really liked hunting. That was built in the middle of the 19th century. The Border House is a classicist chateau built around 1820 that sits on what used to be the Moravian-Austrian border until that was shifted in 1920. The Temple of the Three Graces is a massive half-circle gallery with statues of the Muses, the Three Graces, and figures representing the sciences. Janohrad, or John's Castle, is a Gothic revival edifice of fake ruins about four kilometers from Lednica. You can walk there, hire a horse-drawn carriage, or even take a small boat. This was part of this romantic notion of the time where things from the past were considered to be somehow a better value and craftsmanship, even in decay, than modern things. And anybody who was anybody wanted an old ruined castle. So the Liechtensteins built a brand new ruined castle and then had giant, huge, raucous parties there. The Pohansko Empire-style hunting lodge is huge and houses a large collection of artifacts from the Great Moravian Empire, as well as restored parts of the old Czechoslovak border fortifications. It's a little further out, just south of the utterly uninteresting city of Pšetslov. There's an obelisk a little bit northwest of the main park by Lednica, erected in commemoration of the Peace of Campo Formio in 1798 between France and Austria. This has inspired one of the local wineries to call themselves Obelisk Winery, housed in an extremely modern building right where an old border guard station used to sit. In that same large park area, over by Lednica, there's a Moorish waterworks, an aqueduct, and a so-called cave to hell. And finally, there's my favorite thing there, the minaret. The story goes, supposedly, that the Liechtensteins wanted to build the largest cathedral in all of Europe here, but the local townspeople, who had a certain amount of say in matters concerning their environments at the time, rejected it because the Liechtensteins seemed to have, well, peculiar and some people thought pagan tastes. And they were very worried as to what the hell that cathedral would have on it. So the Liechtensteins built the largest minaret outside of the Muslim world instead. A 62 meter tall observation tower shaped like an Islamic minaret inscribed with sayings from the Quran in Arabic and in German. It sits there in the park poking up through the trees like a big middle finger to the townsfolks. From the top you can see the whole park area and if the day is especially clear you can see all the way to Vienna which is 90 kilometers south by southwest. And there are other structures scattered here and there. There are smaller shelters and sleeping quarters and hunting lodges. And you get it. The place is wild. And then, of course, there are the two towns themselves of Lednica and Voltica, each of which has a chateau. The one at Lednica also has a massive greenhouse, while part of the interior of the one in Voltica was turned into a hotel in the communist days and is still decorated in what I like to call high commie style. And then there's the wine. The Moravian wine scene is very energetic, and there are some excellent things to drink coming out of the region. 
Though you can get some things in Lednica, Valtica is the main wine town here, and you can visit the National Wine Salon as well as many small wine tasting rooms and wine purveyors. There's even a Viticulture High School here, the only one in the country that has their own tasting room. These are wines that you can only try by going there. They do not sell them. They do not let them leave the property. One of the oldest wine cellars in town was built back in 1640 and has a capacity for a million liters of the good stuff. And the wine cellar at the Chateau is even older, built in 1430, one of the oldest in the whole country. The food in the area is also fairly interesting. Some say that the classic Czech dish, and my favorite, Svičkova na Smetanje, was invented in the Lednica Voltica area. Originally, they say it was made with venison, not beef. That makes sense since they were such big hunters. The unusual dessert pšesnjaki, which are potato dough pancakes stuffed with plum jam and poppy seeds, are also from the area. Sweet apricot or strawberry dumplings are also a local specialty, though they're often eaten as a main course. Now, you could conceivably do this on a day trip, I guess, if you got up really early and took the very last transportation home. But honestly, taking a weekend or even three days would be a lot more relaxing and a lot more fun. There's no direct train or bus to either Valtica or Lednica, so you have to go to Brno or Pcheslav and transfer. And this could take a while, which is why trying to do it and then return to Prague in one day is maybe not such a great idea. If you drive, it should take three hours or so, depending on traffic. And the good news there is that it would be easy to get between Valtica and Lednica, and you could explore the wider region easily, even heading into the Palava to the wonderful town of Mikhailov, or head west on your way back to Prague and hit up Znoimo, which is another wine town, or even just pop over the border into Austria, which is just four kilometers away. And of course, you could buy a bunch of wine while you're there, stick it in the car, and take it back home, which is maybe the best thing of all. The bad part of driving is that the driver obviously couldn't drink any of that delicious Moravian wine on days that they had to drive. So, those are the first six places in the Czech Republic that were put on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Each one is unique and very much worth visiting. In future episodes, we'll look at the other places on the list as well as some that are on the tentative list as well. Until then, thank you for listening and happy travels. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times. <laughs>